Please join me in welcoming Purdue University President Mitch Daniels. Thank you all. Enough of that. Much appreciated, as was this, this chance to be back here. It's been a little while, and that didn't used to be the case. I, uh, uh, I hope I didn't wear out my welcome, but, it, but for 10 years, I was in northwest Indiana on average uh, once a month. Uh, we still have a record of that. There were 77 trips to Lake County, 40-odd trips to Porter County, 30-odd uh, trips to LaPorte County, and everywhere else near here. Uh, and that was a reflection, first of all, of the enormous importance of this part of the state and its uh, uh, realizing its full potential uh, to all uh, your neighbors elsewhere in Indiana, uh, but also of the, the fact that uh, uh, I was just uh, determined to make sure people here felt uh, noticed and, and appreciated in a way that it, it is not easy to do given the vagaries of geography and media markets and all the rest of that. So delighted to be back. You know, I, found, I, I proved in that time, to my disappointment, that you just can't punch through with shoe leather. No matter how many times you come here, there's just too many people. There's only the, the Northwest Times is the one indigenous uh, vehicle, and uh, no matter how uh, many miles you put on yourself, you just can't get through. In fact, the best way to communicate was always to either go to Chicago or to be on their media which uh, got easier over the course of time, especially as they saw a much a, a widening contrast between where things were going in Illinois and where things were going in Indiana. So they used to love to beat up on their own, you know, by getting me on there. I still get asked when I'm in Chicago about the time, this is now, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I'm on uh, Don and Roma, I think, uh, one, uh, one morning. I don't remember what the crisis du jour was over there, some, some catastrophe or scandal or something. Um, so they, they, they recite the, how bad that is and how good things are going over here. And they said, uh, so you know, you know, we're broke and you're AAA and, and we're corrupt and you guys are honest and uh, I don't know how they put it. And they, they said, so you know, how's that feel? Well, it's live radio, you gotta say something. I said, oh, it's like living next door to the Simpsons. You know, there's a dysfunctional family on a block and we're looking right in the picture window. To this day, when I'm in Chicago, people go, hey, I'm Homer, you know, things like that. Uh, another time I was up there, uh, it happened to be the day of the Olympics decision. Remember, they were competing for, and, uh, and uh, it, it, the town was electric. There was bandstands, people running around in matching t-shirts, there's balloons everywhere. and. And we were for them. I, you know, Indiana, we'd sent a letter. And, you know, we thought we might get a, I don't know, field hockey game or something over on our side of the line. Well, along about mid-morning comes the shocking news. They not only didn't win, they didn't get out of the first round of balloting. So balloons come down, the bandstand empties, and the t-shirts disappear. So I did. I went about my business, and I, the noontime uh, event was a a speech to a great big crowd, bigger than this one. And uh, I gave whatever my pitch was at the time, and then we go to a Q&A session. Very first question, guy over here says, what's your reaction to the Olympics decision? I don't know why he was asking me, but I said, well, you know, again, you gotta say something. I said, what is this world coming to when Chicago can't fix an election anymore? <laughs> and, and, like the crowd laughed, the media, I could see the media scribbling, and I realized, oh, no, you've done it again, you know, and, you know, the Governor Quinn was not amused. <laughs> uh, but anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm thrilled to be back, and uh, I'm, I'm going to move as fast as I can. I, I feel because it's my job, I want to tell you a little bit about us, that is to say, Purdue. I want to say a few words about you. Uh, our, our friends and neighbors of Northwest uh, Indiana. And when I talk about you, I'm really talking about all of us. So I'll, I'll try to make that plain. So let me just uh, tell you a little bit about what's going on at what I now uh, unapologetically assert is Indiana's flagship university. Uh, uh, in 
West Lafayette. Well, they promised me this thing would advance. Let me try to see if, I, see if that works. Yeah, um, there's new ratings. Uh, there have been a lot of these, but there's a new one. The Wall Street Journal decided that uh, the ones that were out there were a little bit misleading, and, and they uh, uh, ranked uh, all the universities last year, and we were tied with, with Cal Berkeley, behind only uh, North Carolina, UCLA, and Michigan, not bad company. And the question is, why did they come to that conclusion? Um, we've, been, we, we've had, I believe, a, a pretty good run at Purdue. We've been setting records in these areas and we're going, uh, year after year, and that's going to happen again. We've been flooded with applicants. Um, uh, records, uh, again, uh, this year, of 48,000 total. Um, we're going to take in uh, our largest class in over a decade. Uh, consequently, it has the most Hoosiers that we've been able to take in for a long time. Big, big jumps in underrepresented minorities and diversifying the student body. Uh, we've moderated the number of international students, still one of the more cosmopolitan campuses in the country, but uh, been feathering that down. And again, this year, it's been true now for several years, the entering profile, SATs and ACTs and all that's by far the highest of any of our public universities. This I just because of this event, I uh, happened to ask, and this is a stunning and, I, to me, a very thrilling uh, fact. When I got this over the weekend, I sent it back and said, there's got to be an apples and oranges problem. You counted more counties. No, this is, these are the data. We've had a huge surge in this year's freshman class in, uh, we will have, in students from Northwest Indiana. And I'm just so happy about that. <laughs> Um, we believe our, our policy of affordability, uh, it'll be, uh, as Chris uh, was sort of pointing out, um, it'll be less expensive to go to Purdue in 2019 than it was in 2012. And we know that that's getting noticed, and we know that's a big factor everywhere in applications coming in. But uh, uh, to, to anybody here who's sending us a student or encourage someone else to, thank you very much. We're going to do right by them, I promise you, and it's just going to be a lot of fun to have, as you see here, uh, well over 600 or over 600 uh, students from, these, from this uh, region uh, with us. Uh, we are, uh, when, I, when I talk about our being the flagship, I, in, in part that's because the world has come to us. This is, a, you know, the term STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. This, in, a, in the technological uh, knowledge economy uh, uh, that we're uh, living in, uh, it, it clearly, uh, the, our, our historic mission as a land-grant school and, uh, and our strengths at Purdue have come into their own uh, more than ever. And uh, we have been investing and expanding in, uh, in what is already one of the most STEM-centric universities in the country. 60% uh, of this year's entering class actually uh, will be in one another engineering or science or math or one of the technological disciplines, the kind on which... Uh, uh, so much economic progress for our state and nation depend. As I mentioned earlier, it's, uh, we've been working very hard to recruit the students of different backgrounds, and big record last year, going to surpass it by a lot this year. We're very pleased with that. And uh, 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 it used to be thought that with bigger classes, you, uh, let me say it the other way, that if you became more selective, the way to get your graduation rates up was to only take smarter students. And uh, we, don't, we don't believe in that at Purdue. We want to educate every possible student we can and uh, see uh, ideally every one of them succeed. And so it takes extra effort. We do things we didn't used to do. Um, uh, I don't think he'd mind my saying. Mayor Costas over here was telling me during the luncheon that uh, his son is headed for the finish line, going to finish strong, but there was some extra uh, help that he got along the way from advisors and faculty and so forth. We now stress that that's a big responsibility. Our faculty are no longer promoted at Purdue only on uh, teaching and research. We wrote into our, at the Board of Trustees' insistence, we wrote into the tenure and promotion policy a requirement that uh, a, a faculty member show they have invested of themselves in coaching and mentoring and, and uh, personally uh, helping students. You won't get lifelong employment at our school anymore unless you're willing to do that. Here's something that didn't make any sense to track before, but 
Uh, now uh, we are. Uh, over 5% of this year's um, graduates will finish in less than four years. And we're going to do a lot of things. We're doing a lot of things right now to move that up. Um, and um, uh, where possible, if a student can finish in fewer years, fewer than four years, they not only save a lot of money, but uh, they get an earlier start in life with income that will compound over their careers in a way that's pretty uh, impressive. So here are those affordability numbers. Um, uh, we have uh, frozen tuition for four years. Uh, Sunday, when this weekend rather, when, when we uh, graduated several thousand seniors, that was the second of at least four classes that will go all the way through Purdue and never see a tuition increase. In state, out of state, everybody. Meanwhile, we did bring down the cost of room and board and books, so it will be literally less expensive. Forget inflation. Literally less expensive in nominal dollars to go to our school in 2019 than it was seven years before. And one of our folks likes to calculate this. If we had gone up at the national average, just at the national average college uh, tuition increase, as, this is as of last year, be more by now, uh, uh, Purdue families would have spent $226 million instead of our having it, they had it for, uh, they have it for uh, uh, use in their households and to get their kids off to a faster start. And holding the line on cost in this way has had a natural effect on tuition. Again, I think Chris mentioned it, but here you see, uh, not tuition, sorry, student debt. We are uh, down 30%, $53 million. This also is last year's number, and in a month or two we'll have it updated. It'll be significantly more. And we all have been learning a lot about what too much student debt does to slow down pe young people in life. It's not just the individual consequences. They're postponing marriage. They're postponing home ownership. They're postponing, they're starting businesses at a lower rate than American, uh, Americans have probably ever. And we know student debt burden is a big part of that. And so it's a problem for them, and it's a problem for us all as it, as it feathers through the economy. I don't know if I skipped something or not, but no, here we go. I just want to mention uh, we're trying a lot of new things at Purdue, and one of them, come back. This thing. I'll get you there in a minute. Let me just tell you that we're starting a high school this August. Uh, in Indianapolis, inner city Indianapolis, the Purdue Polytechnic High School. Uh, I don't know if we can do this or not. All I know is that if we wait on the K-12 system of this state to serve up enough students who can make it uh, in, the, in the more competitive than ever atmosphere at Purdue right now, um, we will never have as diverse a student body as we want. So we're gonna start a high school uh, under the sponsorship of our Purdue Polytechnic Institute and um, we're going to uh, uh, see if four years from now, um, the goal, the assignment I've given these folks is, you've got to take inner city kids, who, many of whom will already be behind after eight years. Four years later, when they walk across a stage down there, I want there to be an admission to Purdue University in their diploma. Now, I don't know if we can do that, but that's, you know, I think somebody needs to try. And I mention it here because we, if we can do this in one place, then it'd be our, it's really our goal to build a network of these high schools around the state, including somewhere uh, here in the region. I'm just going to skip through some of this one. Uh, as I've sometimes said to our friends in the Indiana General Assembly, if Indiana didn't have, in this era, in this, in this economy, in this world, uh, if we didn't have a Purdue University, we would be scrambling to invent it. What do I mean? I mean a STEM-based uh, university that is going to turn out uh, new engineers and technologists and computer scientists and so forth in very large numbers, superbly trained. But not stopping there, we feel we have a responsibility to be an economic engine in our own right. And uh, we have records now for research, patents, and so forth. Uh, we've risen to 15th in the world in patents. Uh, we've had more companies start on our campus. 27 companies started last year by students and faculty than any other single campus in the country. So um, 
both uh, indirectly through the students we produce, but directly through, we hope, the technologies and the new uh, job-creating businesses we hope to produce over time, uh, we're out to be uh, as valuable um, a, an asset to this state as we possibly can be. I'm going to say a word or two about something we've been in the news for lately. Um, it's called Project Moral, after Abe Lincoln's uh, ally who passed the Moral Act, the Land Grant Act that created universities like Purdue. And we were put, we never forget, we were put here to open the gates of higher education beyond the wealthy and the elites. That's who was going to school through the Civil War in this country. And it was an inspired action that, uh, that created land grant schools like Purdue. And uh, we also know that in this world, already one in seven uh, post-secondary students are studying completely online. I don't know where this is going, but I know the direction. It isn't going to get any smaller. And we were not equipped as a campus to uh, participate very fully in it. So we did something about it. Uh, here we are with the, uh, I put Purdue Northwest on top for a reason here. We're so excited about the uh, prospects for what is now the fifth biggest university in the state to make uh, uh, similar contributions to your region. Um, with the combined power of those two campuses under one very, uh, Tom Keehan, a, a, a great leader and, and very committed, I hope you know, to uh, uh, growth and uh, community development up here, um, we, we see a, a really important assignment to be a, a bigger uh, force for good than we've been before. Um, so we, uh, we uh, got into a conversation with a company you've probably heard of named Kaplan Inc. Uh, Graham Holdings, Don Graham, who were uh, his, his mother, Catherine Graham, they were in the Washington Post. This company owned the Washington Post till recently when they sold it to Amazon, or to its Amazon's owner. Uh, so they, they do four things, but one of them is, uh, has been an online university, and uh, we uh, have acquired it. Or I should say, we have acquired the academic uh, aspects of it. They have uh, a couple thousand faculty, most of them operating virtually. And uh, if we get the, rest the uh, necessary approvals later this year, this will be a, uh, a new unit of Purdue University and dealing with a completely different section of society. Just as the population at Purdue Northwest is different than the population at I'll get to this in a minute, I guess. This is the size and shape of the new U. They have about, about the same number of students we have at Lafayette right now, coincidentally. 12,300 degrees they conferred last year. Yeah, um, just as Tom Keehan um, and my friend Jim Dworkin, who's here uh, before him at uh, North Central, at, uh, serve an audience that is somewhat older uh, and, and very different than those who are able to pick up and move to West Lafayette for four years, this stratum will be different yet. Uh, average age, 33. Typical, uh, typical student is female, three to one. Minority, over 50% uh, uh, over are minorities and with what are considered risk factors. And yet they deserve a chance too. This is just the world, we all know this, where a high school diploma is not enough. And uh, there's an astonishing number of people nationally and in this state. There's three quarters of a million people in this state who started college and never finished. And if we can get them across the finish line, what a boost for them in life, what an important boost we think uh, for our state or any other place where we are able to uh, deliver that service. And uh, the weekend before we announced it, uh, I swore him to secrecy because this all had to be, but I called the last uh, President Obama's uh, Secretary of Education, a really fine uh, person, Arnie Duncan, your neighbor from Chicago, and told him what we intended to do. And uh, he said much more than this actually, but these, these lines he wanted to, um, to uh, talk about in the, uh, on the day of the announcement. So we hope that we have, we have done something uh, effective here and that the, the Purdue of tomorrow will be serving not just its historic um, audiences, or the, uh, but, uh, but this uh, all-important one of working adults um, and uh, uh, in addition. 
Let me finish by just uh, saying a few things uh, uh, about my continued excitement and enthusiasm for Northwest Indiana and the uh, communities and the enterprises represented in this room. I said it from the first day of 2003, no name first time candidate, I kept saying Indiana cannot be great till all parts of Indiana are great and in particular the second largest concentration of, of people and potential uh, in our state. And uh, uh, we worked on that as, as much as we uh, knew how. There's, it, to me, there's, there, there's so much still ahead of you here. There's been a lot of progress, and especially lately. I'm very, very encouraged by at least the things I, I think I see and read. But, uh, you know, my gosh, the sky's still the limit. You know, uh, especially given the travails of our neighbor to the west, uh, we should be eating their lunch. But unfortunately, we look, we should be eating Illinois' lunch. Unfortunately, too often, we look too much like Illinois. You know, uh, uh, three things that require, uh, I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know. I'm not telling you anything I, had, I didn't say for a dozen years. Three areas where we've just got to improve to, to uh, open the huge cornucopia of opportunity. Uh, I would say our, our business climate, quality of local government, and the fragmentation of what should be a much more a, a unified and, a region acting in concert. You know, in business climate, um, uh, Indiana for now, for uh, seven or eight years anyway, doesn't matter who's doing the rating, our state climate is rated the best in America with a, along with a couple of Sunbelt states. You know, Texas usually in there, occasionally Florida, Tennessee maybe. We're the only one north of Dixie that makes it. So the, the preconditions for much better growth are there and you know, they're happening in, in much of Indiana. But um, uh, you know, it, it, some, of those, some of those conditions are just not, to be honest, as optimal here. You know, I was in, I was in a, another time I was in Chicago, I was speaking at a, a, somebody's conference on state economic policy. How do you create, we used to talk about building the best sandbox in America for people to come and invest and live. And uh, uh, one of the guys on the morning program, I'm the luncheon speaker, one of the guys before I get there is this guy Jimmy something who founded Jimmy John Sandwich Shop. He's really quite a character, of, you know, just what you'd imagine, you know, very voluble and uh, uh, extrovert salesman. So anyway, he goes off apparently and says, you know, man, Illinois, it's like they don't want you around here. He says, you know, these people in Indiana, we've been talking to them, we may move some stuff over there, they've got their act together. He basically gives our commercial about taxes and regulation and a fair litigation climate and he says uh, and man they, they you know they, they act like business people they they were quick they got right back to us he says not only that next day the governor of the state called me and he talked like a businessman and before we him hung up he gave me his personal email and cell number he says now that's the way you do business so I, I get there at noon he comes running across he wants to tell me this story he says after his panel they go to the Q&A and some guy says, my question is for Jimmy, but Jimmy, first, I have to tell you something. Here in Illinois, when they give you the governor's cell number, it means something different. <laughs> it's a pretty good line, actually. So anyway, I just implore you, not just on your own behalf, although that's the most important thing, the more that you can uh, join the parade of Hoosier uh, uh, localities and regions which are welcoming to business. The question every day should be, what can we do to be, make it, I used to say, how can we make it today uh, more affordable and more convenient to hire a Hoosier as opposed to somewhere, somebody somewhere else? What can you do to uh, put, you know, what's in it for me, government, behind you? I, I, still see articles about, you know, local officials and so forth uh, doing things they shouldn't. And, uh, you know, that's, you, you've had great, you've had leadership, you've spoken out, but, you know, the job's not finished and you, it's just not tolerable. And it gets in the way of better life for, for uh, you and succeeding generations here. And then the more you can do, and boy, I guess I see real success happening here, I think I do, to act more in concert, 
act in the common good, not one community against the next, against the next, everybody chiseling and protecting their own turf. You know, there, there are people here who, when, when we uh, leased the Indiana, the Indiana Toll Road, was able to, without a single penny of borrowing or a single penny of new taxes, were able to build like nobody in America built. The first thing we did, though, was carve off $120 million for a concept called a regional development authority. And, uh, and what did we say? We'll, we'll, this money is for just for Northwest Indiana, and it's, but it's got to be a vehicle where counties come to, together and stop fighting each other and figure out some things that are good for everybody. And I guess that's starting to happen. And I'm just so glad for you that it is. And thanks to everybody here who is, has been part of that. Pete Viskoloski, I guess, is still here, was, was a friend, and we got all that going. And uh, uh, Lee Morris led it. I mean, there's, these, these folks have had, I know, and, but they and their successors deserve all the support you can give them because you're a powerhouse if you put the whole region in, this, in the same harness. So. Uh, I just want to tell you how much fun it's been to be back and uh, uh, how uh, I'm, if you hear distant cheers from a little bit to the southeast every time you um, take a big step forward, uh, make a smart investment, attract a new business, uh, that'd be me. And uh, I'm still of, of exactly the same mind I was on the first of those hundred and however many visits up here. Um, this is a great area. It's just like the pastor said. There's so much to be grateful for, but there's so much headroom for improvement. I just know you're going to find it. Good luck and take care.